Religion and Poetry by Washington Gladden From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The High Life, Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Lian Yao Craig Franklin Jason in Canada Sonia and Thomas Peter Religion and Poetry The time is not long past when the copulative in that title might have suggested to some minds an antithesis, as acid and alkali, or heat and cold. That religion could have affiliation with anything so wildly as poetry would have seemed to some pious people a questionable proposition. There were the Psalms, in the Old Testament to be sure, and the minister had been heard to allude to them as poetry. Might not that indicate some heretical taint in him, caught, perchance, from the German neologists whose influence we were beginning to dread? It did not seem quite orthodox to describe the Psalms as poems, and when, a little later, someone ventured to speak of the Book of Job as a dramatic poem, there were many who were simply horrified. Indeed, it was difficult for many good people to consider the biblical writings as in any sense literature. They belonged in a category by themselves, and the application to them of the terms by which we describe similar writings in other books appeared to many good men and women a kind of profanation. This was not, of course, the attitude of educated men and women, but something akin to it affected large numbers of excellent people. We are well past that period, and the relations of religion and poetry may now be discussed with no fear of misunderstandings. These relations are close and vital. Poetry is indebted to religion for its largest and loftiest inspirations, and religion is indebted to poetry for its subtlest and most luminous interpretations. Religion is related to poetry as life is related to art. Religion is life, the life of God in the soul of man, the response of man's spirit to the attractions of the divine spirit. Poetry is an interpretation of life. Religious poetry endeavours to express, in beautiful forms, the facts of the religious life. There is poetry that is not religious, poetry which deals only with that which is purely sensuous, poetry which does not hint at spiritual facts or divine relations. And there is religion which has but little to do with poetry. But the highest religious thoughts and feelings are greatly served by putting them into poetic forms. And the greatest poetry is always that which sets forth the facts of the religious life. Without love to man and love to God, says Dr. Strong, the greatest poetry is impossible. Mere human love to God is not enough to stir the deepest chords either in the poet or in his readers. It is the connection of human love with the divine love that gives it permanence and security. If, then, religion is the supreme experience of the human spirit, and that experience finds its most perfect literary expression in poetry, the present volume ought to contain a precious collection of the best literature. And anyone who wished to give to a friend a volume which would convey to him the essential elements of religion would probably be safe to choose this volume rather than any prose treatise upon theology ever printed. He who reads this book through will get a clearer and truer idea of what the religious life is than any philosophical discussion could give him. For this poetry is an attempt to express life, not to explain it. It offers pictures or reports rather than analyses of religious experience. It gives utterance to the real life of religion in the individual soul, and is not a generalization of religious thoughts and feelings. The sources from which this collection has been drawn are abundant and varied. The psalmody and hymnology of the church furnish a vast preserve, the exploration of which would be a large undertaking. It must be confessed that the pious people who had in their hands some of the ancient hymn books were justified in feeling that religion and poetry were not closely related, for many of the hymns they were wont to sing were guiltless of any poetic character. It was too often evident 
that the hymn writer had been more intent on giving metrical form to proper theological concepts than on giving utterance to his own religious life but the feeling has been growing that in hymns at any rate life is more than dogma and we have now some collections of hymns that come pretty near being books of poetry the improvement in this department of literature within the past twenty-five years has been marked there is still indeed in many hymnals and especially in hymnals for sunday schools and social meetings much doggerel but large recent contributions of hymns which are true poetry many of the best of them from american sources have made it possible to furnish our congregations with admirable manuals of praise the indebtedness of religion to poetry which is thus expressed in the hymnology of the church is very large probably many of us are indebted for definite and permanent religious conceptions and impressions quite as much to felicitous phrases of hymns as to any words of sermon or catechism our most positive convictions of religious truth are apt to come to us in some line or stanza that tells the whole story the rhythm and the rhyme have helped to fix it and hold it in the memory this is true not only of the hymns of the church but of many poems that are not suitable for singing english poetry is especially rich in meditative and devotional elements and of no period has this been more true than of the nineteenth century cooper wordsworth coleridge the brownings tennyson and matthew arnold on the other side of the sea with bryant longfellow emerson whittier lowell holmes lanier sill and gilder on this side these and many others have made most precious additions to our store of religious poetry the century has been one of the great perturbations in religious thought the advent of the evolutionary philosophy threatened all the theological foundations and there was need of a thorough revision of the dogmas which were based on a mechanical theology and of a reinterpretation of the life of the spirit in all this the poets have given us the strongest help the great poet cannot be oblivious of these deepest themes he need not be a dogmatician indeed he cannot be for his business is insight not ratiocination but the problems which theology is trying to solve must always be before his mind and he must have something to say about them if he hopes to command the attention of thoughtful men yet while we need not depreciate the service that has been rendered by preachers and professional theologians who have sought to put the facts of the religious life into the forms of the new philosophy we must own our deeper obligation to the poets by whose vision the spiritual realities have been most clearly discerned it was wordsworth perhaps who gave us the first great contribution to the new religious thought by bringing home to us the fact that god is in his world revealing himself now as clearly as in any of the past ages the truth of the divine eminence which is the foundation of all the more positive religious thinking of today and which is destined when once its import has been fully grasped to revolutionize our religious life is made familiar to our thought in wordsworth's poetry to him it was simply an experience in quite another sense than that in which it was true of spinoza it might have been said of him that he was a god intoxicated man and although his clear english sense permitted no pantheistic merging of the human in the divine but kept the individual consciousness clear for choice and duty the realization of the presence of god made nature in his thought supernatural and life sublime to him as dr strong has said it was plain that imagination in man enables him to enter into the thought of god the creative element in us is the medium through which we perceive the meaning of the creator in his creation the world without answers to the world within because god is the soul of both such minds are truly from the deity for they are powers 
and hence the highest bliss that flesh can know is theirs the consciousness of whom they are habitually infused through every image and through every thought and all affections by communion raised from earth to heaven from human to divine the mystical faith by which man is united to god can have no clearer confession and in the great poem of tintern abbey this truth received an expression which has become classical it must be counted one of the greatest words of that continuing revelation by which the truths of religion are given permanent form for i have learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youth but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity nor harsh nor grating though of ample power to chasten and subdue and i have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things all objects of all thought and rolls through all things we can hardly imagine that the religious experience of mankind will ever suffer these words to drop into forgetfulness and it would seem that every passing generation must deepen their significance the same great testimony to the divine presence in our lives is borne by many other witnesses in memorable words lowell's voice is clear no man can think nor in himself perceive sometimes at waking in the street sometimes or on the hillside always unforewarned a grace of being finer than himself that beckons and is gone a larger life upon his own impinging with swift glimpse of spacious circles luminous with mind to which the ethereal substance of his own seems but gross cloud to make that visible touched to a sudden glory round the edge if to this central truth of religion the reality of the communion of the human spirit with the divine the poets have borne such impressive testimony not less positively have they asserted many other of the great things of the spirit sometimes they have helped us to believe by identifying themselves with us in our struggles with the doubts that loosen our hold on the great realities no man of the last century has done more for christian belief than alfred tennyson albeit he has been a confessed doubter but what he said of arthur hallam is quite as true of himself he fought his doubts and gathered strength he would not make his judgment blind he faced the spectres of the mind and laid them thus he came at length to find a stronger faith his own and power was with him in the night which makes the darkness and the light and dwells not in the light alone those words of his so often quoted are often sadly misused there lives more faith in honest doubt believe me than in half the creeds when men make these words an excuse for an attitude of habitual negation and denial assuming that it is better to doubt everything than to believe anything they grossly pervert the poet's meaning it is the faith that lives in honest doubt that his heart applauds he is thinking of the fact that it is real faith in god which leads men to doubt the dogmas which misrepresent god but conscious as he is of the shadow that lies upon our field of vision he is always insisting that it is in the light and not in the shadow that we must walk therefore although demonstration is impossible faith is rational so do those great words of the ancient sage admonish us thou canst not prove that thou art body alone nor canst thou prove that thou art spirit alone nor canst thou prove that thou art both in one thou canst not prove thou art immortal no nor yet that thou art mortal nay my son thou canst not prove that i who speak with thee am not thyself in converse with thyself for nothing worthy proving can be proven nor yet disproven wherefore be thou wise cleave ever to the sunnier sight of doubt and cling to faith beyond the forms of faith 
she reels not in the storm of warring words she brightens at the clash of yes and no she sees the best that glimmers through the worst she feels the sun is hid but for a night she spies the summer through the winter bud she tastes the fruit before the blossom falls she hears the lark within the songless egg she finds the fountain where they wailed mirage this illustrates tennyson's mental attitude if all who plume themselves upon their doubts would put themselves into this posture of mind they would find themselves in possession of a very substantial faith tennyson has touched with light more than one problem of the soul the little stanza beginning flower in the crannied wall has shown us how the mysteries of being are shared by the commonest lives the short lyric wages condenses into a few lines the strongest proof of the life to come and crossing the bar has borne many a spirit in peace out to the boundless sea robert browning's robust faith helps us in a different way his daring and triumphant optimism makes us ashamed of doubt in apt vogler in rabbi ben ezra in pompilia in christmas eve we are caught up and carried onward by an unflinching and overcoming faith perhaps the most convincing arguments for religious reality in browning's poems are those of an epistle and of cleon where the cry of the human soul for the assurance which the christian faith supplies is given such a penetrating voice and there is no reasoning about the incarnation in any theological book that i have ever read which seems to me so cogent as that great passage in saul where david cries could i wrestle to raise him from sorrow grow poor to enrich to fill up his life starve my own out i would knowing which i know that my service is perfect oh speak through me now would i suffer for him that i love so wouldst thou so wilt thou but after all browning's great hymns of faith are those in which he faces the future like prospice and the prologue of la Cecias, and the epilogue of asolando triumphant songs in which one of the healthiest minded of human beings showed himself one who never turned his back but marched breast forward never doubted clouds would break never dreamed though right were worsted wrong would triumph held we fall to rise are baffled to fight better sleep to wake it would be a grateful task to make extended record of the service rendered to religion by the great choir of singers whose names appear upon the pages of this book to elizabeth barrett browning our debt is large though her note is oftenest plaintive and the faith which she illustrates is that by which suffering is turned to strength our own new england psalmist also has been to great multitudes a revealer and a comforter few in any age have seen the central truths of christianity more clearly or felt them more deeply or uttered them more convincingly in such poems as my soul and i my psalm our master the eternal goodness the brewing of soma and andrew reichman's prayer whittier has made the whole religious world his debtor how many more there are of those whom the world reckons as the greater bards and of those whom it assigns to lower places to whom we have found ourselves indebted for the clearing of our vision or the quickening of our pulses in our studies or our meditations upon the deepest questions of life how many there are whose faces we never saw but who by some luminous word some strain vibrant with tenderness some flash of insight have endeared themselves to us forever they are the friends of our spirits ministers to us of the holiest things they have clothed for us the highest truth in forms of beauty they have made it winsome and real and dear and memorable is there anything better than this that one man can do for another washington gladden end of religion and poetry by washington gladden this recording is in the public domain.
Song from Pippa Passes by Robert Browning From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Song The years at the spring And days at the morn Mornings at seven The hillsides do pout The larks on the wing The snails on the thorn God's in his heaven All's right with the world End of poem this recording is in the public domain. A Passage in the Life of St. Augustine by Anonymous From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada as the narrator Craig Franklin as St. Augustine And Thomas Peter as the boy a passage in the life of saint augustine long poured saint austin o'er the sacred page and doubt and darkness overspread his mind on god's mysterious being thought the sage the triple person in one godhead joined the more he thought the harder did he find to solve the various doubts which fast arose and as a ship caught by imperious wind tosses where chance its shattered body throws so tossed his troubled soul and nowhere found repose heated and feverish then he closed his tome and went to wander by the ocean side where the cool breeze at evening loved to come murmuring responsive to the murmuring tide and as augustine o'er its margent wide strayed deeply pondering the puzzling theme a little child before him he espied in earnest labor did the urchin seem working with heart intent close by the sounding stream he looked and saw the child a hole had scooped shallow and narrow in the shining sand o'er which at work the laboring infant stooped still pouring water in with busy hand the saint addressed the child in accents bland fair boy quoth he i pray what toil is thine let me its end and purpose understand the boy replied an easy task is mine to sweep into this hole all the wide ocean's brine to hope foolish boy the saint exclaimed to hope that the broad ocean in that hole should lie o oh, foolish saint exclaimed the boy thy scope is still more hopeless than the toil i ply who thinks to comprehend god's nature high in the small compass of thine human wit sooner augustine sooner far shall i confine the ocean in this tiny pit than finite minds conceive god's nature infinite end of poem this recording is in the public domain Meditations of a Hindu Prince by Sir Alfred Comyn Lyell From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Meditations of a Hindu Prince All the world over, I wonder, In lands that I never have trod, Are the people eternally seeking for the signs and steps of a god? westward across the ocean and northward across the snow do they all stand gazing as ever and what do the wisest know here in this mystical india the deities hover and swarm like the wild bees heard in the treetops or the gusts of a gathering storm in the air men hear their voices their feet on the rocks are seen Yet we all say, Whence is the message, and what may the wonders mean? A million shrines stand open, and ever the censer swings, as they bow to a mystic symbol, or the figures of ancient kings. 
and the incense rises ever and rises the endless cry of those who are heavy laden and of cowards loath to die For the destiny drives us together like deer in a pass of the hills above is the sky and around us the sound of the shot that kills pushed by a power we see not and struck by a hand unknown we pray to the trees for shelter and press our lips to a stone the trees wave a shadowy answer and the rock frowns hollow and grim and the form and the nod of the demon are caught in the twilight dim and we look to the sunlight falling afar on the mountain crest is there never a path runs upward to a refuge there and a rest the path ah who has shown it and which is the faithful guide the haven ah who has known it for steep is the mountain side forever the shot strikes surely and ever the wasted breath of the praying multitude rises whose answer is only death here are the tombs of my kinsfolk the fruit of an ancient name chiefs who were slain on the war-field and women who died in flame they are gods these kings of the foretime they are spirits who guard our race ever i watch and worship they sit with a marble face and the myriad idols round me and the legion of muttering priests the revels and rites unholy the dark unspeakable feasts what have they wrung from the silence hath even a whisper come of the secret whence and whither alas for the gods are dumb shall i list to the word of the english who come from the uttermost sea the secret hath it been told you and what is your message to me it is not but the wise world's story how the earth and the heavens began how the gods are glad and angry and a deity once was man i had thought perchance in the cities where the rulers of india dwell whose orders flash from the far land who girdle the earth with a spell they have fathomed the depths we float on or measured the unknown main sadly they turn from the venture and say that the quest is vain is life then a dream and delusion and where shall the dreamer awake is the world seen like shadows on water and what if the mirror break shall it pass as a camp that is struck as a tent that is gathered and gone from the sands that were lamplit at eve and at morning are level and lone is there not in the heaven above whence the hail and the leaven are hurled but the wind that is swept around us by the rush of the rolling world the wind that shall scatter my ashes and bear me to silence and sleep with the dirge and the sounds of lamenting and voices of women who weep end of poem this recording is in the public domain brahma by ralph waldo emerson from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part one read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin brahma if the red slayer thinks he slays or if the slain think he is slain they know not well the supple ways i keep and pass and turn again far or forgot to me is near shadow and sunlight are the same the vanished gods to me appear and one to me are shame and fame they reckon ill who leave me out when me they fly i am the wings i am the doubter and the doubt and i the hymn the brahmin sings the strong gods pine for my abode and pine in vain the sacred seven but thou meek lover of the good 
find me and turn thy back on heaven end of poem this recording is in the public domain hymn to zeus by cleantes translated from the greek from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part one read for LibriVox.org by sonia hymn to zeus most glorious of all the undying many named girt round with awe jove author of nature applying to all things the rudder of law hail hail for it justly rejoices the races whose life is a span to lift unto thee their voices the author and framer of man for we are thy sons thou didst give us the symbols of speech at our birth alone of the things that live and mortal move upon earth wherefore thou shalt find me extolling and ever singing thy praise since thee the great universe rolling on its path round the world obeys obeys thee wherever thou guidest and gladly is bound in thy bands so great is the power thou confidest with strong invincible hands to thy mighty ministering servant the bolt of the thunder that flies two-edged like a sword and fervent that is living and never dies all nature in fear and dismay doth quake in the path of its stroke what time thou preparest the way for the one word thy lips have spoke which blends with light smaller and greater which pervadeth and thrilleth all things so great is thy power and thy nature in the universe highest of kings on earth of all deeds that are done o god there is none without thee in the holy ether not one nor one on the face of the sea save the deeds that evil men driven by their own blind folly have planned but things that have grown uneven are made even again by thy hand and things unseemly grow seemly the unfriendly are friendly to thee for no good and evil supremely thou hast blended in one by decree for all thy decree is one ever a word that endureth for aye which mortals rebellious endeavour to flee from and shun to obey ill-fated that worn with proneness for the lordship of goodly things neither hear nor behold in its oneness the law that divinity brings which men with reason obeying might attain unto glorious life no longer aimlessly straying in the path of ignoble strife there are men with a zeal unblessed that are wearied with following of fame and men with a baser quest that are turned to lucre and shame there are men too that pamper and pleasure the flesh with delicate stings all these desire beyond measure to be other than all these things great jove all giver dark clouded great lord of the thunderbolt's breath deliver the men that are shrouded in ignorance dismal as death o father dispel from their souls the darkness and grant them the light of reason thy stay when the whole wide world thou rulest with might that we being honoured may honour thy name with the music of hymns extolling the deeds of the donor unceasing as rightly beseems mankind for no worthier trust is awarded to god or to man than forever to glory with justice in the law that endures and is one end of poem this recording is in the public domain Te Deum Laudamus, a version from the American Episcopal Church Prayer Book, by Anonymous. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter. Te Deum Laudamus, 
A version from the American Episcopal Church Prayer Book. Note. This venerable hymn, familiar as the part of the morning service in the Roman Catholic and Protestant Episcopal churches, and on special occasions in many Protestant churches, has usually been ascribed to the great St. Ambrose of Milan and St. Augustine, his greater convert, in the year 387 A.D., but, like other productions of mighty influence, it was doubtless a growth. Portions of it appear in the writings of St. Cyprian, 252 A.D., and others in still earlier liturgical forms of the Greek church in Alexandria during the century previous. It is thus probably the earliest, as it is certainly the most universal and famous of Christian hymns. It was translated from the Latin into English in 1549 for the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, which assumed its present form in 1660, during that wonderful era which gave us the English Bible with its unapproached majesty and music of language. We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The Holy Church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee, the Father of an infinite majesty, thine adorable, true, and only Son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, Thou didst humble thyself to be born of a virgin. When thou hadst overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God, in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints, in glory everlasting. O Lord, save thy people, and bless thine heritage. Govern them, and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify thee, and we worship thy name ever, world without end. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy be upon us, as our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted. Let me never be confounded. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Universal Prayer by Alexander Pope From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter The Universal Prayer Father of all, in every age, in every clime adored, By saint, by savage, and by sage, Jehovah, Jove, or Lord, Thou great first cause, least understood, Who all my sense confined to know but this, That thou art good, and that myself am blind, Yet gave me, in this dark estate, To see the good from ill, And, binding nature fast in fate, Left free the human will. What conscience dictates to be done, or warns me not to do. This, teach me more than hell to shun, 
that more than heaven pursue what blessings thy free bounty gives let me not cast away for god is paid when man receives to enjoy is to obey yet not to earth's contracted span thy goodness let me bound or think thee lord alone of man when thousand worlds are round let not this weak unknowing hand presume thy bolts to throw and deal damnation round the land on each i judge thy foe if i am right thy grace impart still in the right to stay if i am wrong oh teach my heart to find that better way save me alike from foolish pride and impious discontent at aught thy wisdom has denied or aught thy goodness lent teach me to feel another's woe to hide the fault i see that mercy i to others show that mercy show to me mean though i am not wholly so since quickened by thy breath oh lead me wheresoe'er i go through this day's life or death this day be bread and peace my lot all else beneath the sun thou knowest if best bestowed or not and let thy will be done to thee whose temple is all space whose altar earth sea skies one chorus let all being raise all nature incense rise end of poem this recording is in the public domain Ode from the Spectator by Joseph Addison From the World's Best Poetry, Volume four, The Higher Life, Part one Read for Librivox.org by Lian Yao Ode The spacious firmament on high, with all the blue ethereal sky, and spangled heavens a shining frame, their great original proclaim the unwearied sun from day to day does his creator's power display and publishes to every land the work of an almighty hand soon as the evening shades prevail the moon takes up the wondrous tale and nightly to the listening earth repeats the story of her birth while all the stars that round her burn and all the planets in their turn confirm the tidings as they roll and spread the truth from pole to pole what though in solemn silence all move round the dark terrestrial ball what though no real voice or sound amid their radiant orbs be found in reason's ear they all rejoice and utter forth a glorious voice forever singing as they shine the hand that made us is divine end of poem this recording is in the public domain Lord, when those glorious lights I see, hymn and prayer for the use of believers. By George Wither. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Four, The Higher Life, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. Lord, when those glorious lights I see. Lord, when those glorious lights I see, with which Thou hast adorned the skies, observing how they move it be and how their splendour fills mine eyes methinks it is too large a grace but that thy love ordained it so that creatures in so high a place should servants be to man below the meanest lamp now shining there in size and lustre doth exceed the noblest of thy creatures here and of our friendship hath no need yet these upon mankind attend for secret aid or public light and from the world's extremest end repair unto us every night o oh, had that stamp been undefaced which first on us thy hand had set how highly should we have been graced since we are so much honoured yet good god for what but for the sake of thy beloved and only son who did on him our nature take were these exceeding favours done 
as we by him have honoured been, let us to him do honours give. Let us uprightness hide our sin, and let us worth from him receive. Yea, so let us by grace improve what thou by nature doth bestow, that thy dwelling place above we may be raised from below. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Him Before Sunrise in the Vale of Chamouni by Samuel Tyler Coleridge From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Him Before Sunrise in the Vale of Chamouni Hast thou a charm to stay the morning star in his steep course? So long he seems to pause on thy bald, awful head, O sovereign Blanc. The arve and arviron at thy base rave ceaselessly, but thou, most awful form, risest from forth thy silent sea of pines, how silently! Around thee and above, deep is the air and dark, substantial, black, an ebon mass. Methinks thou piercest it, as with a wedge. But when I look again, it is thine own calm home, thy crystal shrine, thy habitation from eternity. O dread and silent mount, I gazed upon thee, till thou, still present to the bodily sense, didst vanish from my thought. Entranced in prayer, I worshipped the invisible alone. Yet like some sweet beguiling melody so sweet we know not we are listening to it thou the meanwhile wast blending with my thought yea with my life and life's own secret joy till the dilating soul enwrapped transfused into the mighty vision passing there as in her natural form swelled vast to heaven awake my soul not only passive praise thou owest, Not alone these swelling tears, Mute thanks and secret ecstasy. Awake, voice of sweet song, Awake, my heart, awake! Green vales and icy cliffs All join my hymn. Thou first and chief, sole sovereign of the vale, O oh, struggling with the darkness all the night, And visited all night by troops of stars, or when they climb the sky, or when they sink, companion of the morning star at dawn, thyself earth's rosy star, and of the dawn co-herald, wake, O oh, wake, and utter praise! Who sank thy sunless pillars deep in earth? Who filled thy countenance with rosy light? Who made thee parent of perpetual streams? And you, ye five wild torrents fiercely glad, Who called you forth from night and utter death, From dark and icy caverns called you forth, Down those precipitous black jagged rocks, Forever shattered and the same forever? Who gave you your invulnerable life, Your strength, your speed, your fury and your joy, Unceasing thunder and eternal foam? And who commanded, and the silence came? Here let the billows stiffen and have rest. Ye icefalls, ye that from the mountain's brow adown enormous ravines slope amain, torrents, methinks, that heard a mighty voice and stopped at once amid their maddest plunge. Motionless torrents, silent cataracts, who made you glorious as the gates of heaven beneath the keen full moon? Who bade the sun clothe you with rainbows? Who, with living flowers of loveliest blue, spread garlands at your feet? God! Let the torrents, like a shout of nations, answer, and let the ice plains echo, God! God, sing, ye meadow streams, with gladsome voice! ye pine groves with your soft and soul-like sounds and they too have a voice yon piles of snow and in their perilous fall shall thunder god 
ye living flowers that skirt the eternal frost ye wild goats sporting round the eagle's nest ye eagles playmates of the mountain storm ye lightnings the dread arrows of the clouds ye signs and wonders of the elements utter forth god and fill the hills with praise thou too here mount with thy sky pointing peaks oft from whose feet the avalanche unheard shoots downward glittering through the pure serene into the depth of clouds that veil thy breast thou too again stupendous mountain thou that as i raise my head a while bowed low in adoration upward from thy base slow travelling with dim eyes suffused with tears solemnly seemest like a vapory cloud to rise before me rise o oh, ever rise rise like a cloud of incense from the earth thou kingly spirit throned among the hills thou dread ambassador from earth to heaven great hierarch tell thou the silent sky and tell the stars and tell yon rising sun earth with her thousand voices praises god samuel tyler coleridge end of poem this recording is in the public domain the hills of the lord by william channing gannett from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part one read for librivox dot org by sonia the hills of the lord god ploughed one day with an earthquake and drove his furrows deep the huddling plains upstarted the hills were all a leap but that is the mountain's secret age hidden in their breast god's peace is everlasting are the dream words of their rest he hath made them the haunt of beauty the home elect of his grace he spreadeth his mornings on them his sunsets light their face his thunders tread in music of footfalls echoing long and carry majestic greeting around the silent throng his winds bring messages to them wild storm news from the main they sing it down to the valleys in the love song of the rain green tribes from far come trooping and over the uplands flock he weaveth the zones together in robes for his risen rock they are nurseries for young rivers nests for his flying cloud homesteads for new-born races masterful free and proud the people of tired cities come up to their shrines and pray god freshens again within them as he passes by all day and lo i have caught their secret the beauty deeper than all this faith that life's hard moments when the jarring sorrows befall are but god ploughing his mountains and the mountains yet shall be the source of his grace and freshness and his peace everlasting to me end of poem this recording is in the public domain sunrise by charles tennyson turner from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part one read for librivox dot org by thomas peter sunrise as on my bed at dawn i mused and prayed i saw my lattice pranked upon the wall the flaunting leaves and flitting birds withal a sunny phantom interlaced with shade thanks be to heaven in happy mood i said what sweeter aid my matins could befall than this fair glory from the east hath made what holy slights hath god the lord of all to bid us feel and see we are not free to say we see not for the glory comes nightly and daily 
like the flowing sea his luster pierces through the midnight glooms and at prime hours behold he follows me with golden shadows to my secret rooms end of poem this recording is in the public domain God and Man, from the Essay on Man, Epistles 1 and 4, by Alexander Pope, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada. God and Man, from the Essay on Man, Epistles 1 and 4. Lo, the poor Indian, whose untutored mind sees God in clouds, or hears him in the wind. His soul, proud science never taught to stray far as the solar walk or milky way. Yet simple nature to his hope has given, behind the cloud-topped hill, a humbler heaven. Some safer world in depth of woods embraced, some happier island in the watery waste where slaves once more their native land behold no fiends torment no christians thirst for gold to be contents his natural desire he asks no angel's wing no seraph's fire but thinks admitted to that equal sky his faithful dog shall bear him company go wiser thou and in thy scale of sense weigh thy opinion against providence call imperfection what thou fanciest such say here he gives too little there too much destroy all creatures for thy sport or gust yet cry if man's unhappy god's unjust if man alone engross not heaven's high care alone made perfect here immortal there snatch from his hand the balance and the rod rejudge his justice be the god of god in pride in reasoning pride our error lies all quit their sphere and rush into the skies pride still is aiming at the blest abodes men would be angels angels would be gods aspiring to be gods if angels fell aspiring to be angels men rebel and who but wishes to invert the laws of order sins against the eternal cause all are but parts of one stupendous whole whose body nature is and god the soul that changed through all and yet in all the same great in the earth as in the ethereal frame warms in the sun refreshes in the breeze glows in the stars and blossoms in the trees lives through all life extends through all extent spreads undivided operates unspent breathes in our soul informs our mortal part as full as perfect in a hair as heart as full as perfect in vile man that mourns as the rapt seraph that adorns and burns to him no high no low no great no small he fills he bounds connects and equals all cease then nor order imperfection name our proper bliss depends on what we blame know thy own point this kind this due degree of blindness weakness heaven bestows on thee submit in this or any other sphere secure to be as blessed as thou canst bear safe in the hand of one disposing power or in the natal or the mortal hour all nature is but art unknown to thee all chance direction which thou canst not see all discord harmony not understood all partial evil universal good and spite of pride in erring reason's spite one truth is clear whatever is is right order is heaven's first law and this confessed some are and must be greater than the rest more rich more wise but who infers from hence that such are happier shocks all common sense 
Heaven to mankind impartial we confess. If all are equal in their happiness, But mutual wants this happiness increase, All nature's difference keeps all nature's peace. Condition, circumstance, is not the thing. Bliss is the same in subject or in king. In who obtain defense or who defend? In him who is or him who finds a friend? Heaven breathes through every member of the whole one common blessing as one common soul. Alexander Pope End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Light Shining Out of Darkness by William Cowper From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Light Shining Out of Darkness God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea, and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs, and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful, fresh courage take! The crowds ye so much dread are big with mercy, and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err, and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. God by Gavril Romanovich Grzadin Translation of Sir John Bowring From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin God O oh, thou eternal one, whose presence bright All space doth occupy or motion guide, unchanged through times or devastating flight thou only god there is no god beside being above all beings mighty one whom none can comprehend and none explore who fillest existence with thyself alone embracing all supporting ruling o'er being whom we call god and know no more in its sublime research philosophy may measure out the ocean deep may count the sands or the sun's rays but god for thee there is no weight nor measure none can mount up to thy mysteries reason's brightest spark though kindled by the light in vain would try to trace thy counsels infinite and dark and thought is lost ere thought can soar so high even like past moments in eternity thou from primeval nothingness didst call first chaos then existence lord in thee eternity had its foundation all sprung forth from thee of light joy harmony soul origin all life all beauty thine thy word created all and doth create thy splendour fills all space with rays divine thou art and wert and shall be glorious great light giving life sustaining potentate thy chains the unmeasured universe surround upheld by thee by thee inspired with breath thou the beginning with the end hast bound and beautifully mingled life and death as sparks mount upwards from the fiery blaze so suns are born so worlds spring forth from thee and as the spangles in the sunny rays shine round the silver snow the pageantry of heaven's bright army glitters in thy praise o million torches lighted by thy hand wander unwearied through the blue abyss 
they own thy power accomplish thy command all gay with life all eloquent with bliss what shall we call them piles of crystal light a glorious company of golden streams lamps of celestial ether burning bright suns lighting systems with their joyous beams but thou to these art as the moon to night yes as a drop of water in the sea all this magnificence in thee is lost what are ten thousand worlds compared to thee and what am i then heaven's unnumbered host though multiplied by myriads and arrayed in all the glory of sublimest thought is but an atom in the balance weighed against thy greatness is a cipher brought against infinity what am i then naught naught but the effluence of thy light divine pervading worlds hath reached my bosom too yes in my spirit doth thy spirit shine as shines the sunbeam in a drop of dew naught but i live and on hope's pinions fly eager towards thy presence for in thee i live and breathe and dwell aspiring high even to the throne of thy divinity i am o god and surely thou must be thou art directing guiding all thou art direct my understanding then to thee control my spirit guide my wandering heart though but an atom midst immensity still i am something fashioned by thy hand i hold a middle rank twixt heaven and earth on the last verge of mortal being stand close to the realms where angels have their birth just on the boundaries of the spirit land the chain of being is complete in me in me is matter's last graduation lost and the next step is spirit deity i can command the lightning and am dust a monarch and a slave a worm a god whence came i here and how so marvellously constructed and conceived unknown this clod lives surely through some higher energy for from itself alone it could not be creator yes thy wisdom and thy word created me thou source of life and good thou spirit of my spirit and my lord thy light thy love in their bright plenitude filled me with an immortal soul to spring over the abyss of death and bade it wear the garments of eternal day and wing its heavenly flight beyond this little sphere even to its source to thee its author there o thoughts ineffable o visions blessed though worthless are conceptions all of thee yet shall thy shadowed image fill our breast and waft its homage to thy deity god thus alone my lowly thoughts can soar thus seek thy presence being wise and good midst thy vast works admire obey adore and when the tongue is eloquent no more the soul shall speak in tears of gratitude end of poem this recording is in the public domain God is Everywhere by Robert Nicoll From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao God is Everywhere A trodden daisy from the sward With tearful eye I took, And on its ruined glories I With moving heart did look, For, crushed and broken though it was, that little flower was fair and oh i loved the dying bud for god was there i stood upon the sea beat shore the waves came rushing on the tempest raged in giant wrath the light of day was gone the tempest raged in giant wrath the light of day was gone the sailor from his drowning bark sent up his dying prayer i looked amid the ruthless storm and God was there. I sought a lonely woody dell, Where all things soft and sweet, 
birds flowers and trees and running streams mid bright sunshine did meet i stood beneath an old oak shade and summer round was fair i gazed upon the peaceful scene and god was there i saw a home a happy home upon a bridal day and youthful hearts were blithesome there and aged hearts were gay i sat and sweet and god was there i stood beside an i heard her woeful cry i saw her kiss its fair pale home for god was there i saw to cheer the streams where beauty never smiled where desolation brooded o'er um, and awe upon my spirit crept for god was there upon the forests wide and deep i saw the tempests pass then bent the knee for god in love was everywhere end of poem this recording is in the public domain rocked in the cradle of the deep by emma hart willard from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part one read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter rocked in the cradle of the deep rocked in the cradle of the deep i lay me down in peace to sleep secure i rest upon the wave for thou o lord hast power to save i know thou wilt not slight my call for thou dost mark the sparrow's fall and calm and peaceful shall i sleep rocked in the cradle of the deep when in the dead of night i lie and gaze upon the trackless sky the star-bespangled heavenly scroll the boundless waters as they roll i feel thy wondrous power to save from perils of the stormy wave rocked in the cradle of the deep i calmly rest and soundly sleep and such the trust that still were mine though stormy winds swept o'er the brine although the tempest's fiery breath roused me from sleep to wreck and death in ocean cave still safe with thee the germ of immortality and calm and peaceful shall i sleep rocked in the cradle of the deep End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Goodbye by Ralph Waldo Emerson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Goodbye Goodbye, proud world, I'm going home thou art not my friend and i'm not thine long through thy weary crowds i roam a river arc on the ocean brine long i've been tossed like the driven foam but now proud world i'm going home good-bye to flattery's fawning face to grandeur with his wise grimace to upstart well subverted eye to supple office low and high to crowded halls to court and street to frozen hearts and hasting feet to those who go and those who come good-bye proud world i'm going home i'm going to my own hearthstone bosomed in yon green hills alone a secret nook in a pleasant land whose groves the frolic fairies planned where arches green the live-long day echo the blackbird's roundelay and vulgar feet 
have never trod a spot that is sacred to thought and god oh when i am safe in my sylvan home i tread on the pride of greece and rome and when i am stretched beneath the pines where the evening star so holy shines i laugh at the law and the pride of man at the sophist schools and the learned clan for what are they all in their high conceit when man in the bush with god may meet end of poem this recording is in the public domain O oh God, our help in ages past. By Isaac Watts. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4. The Higher Life, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Leanne Yao. O oh God, our help in ages past. O oh God, our help in ages past. Our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defence is sure before the hills in order stood or earth received her fray from everlasting thou art god to endless years the same a thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun time like an ever-rolling stream bears all its sons away they fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day our god our help in ages past our hope for years to come be thou our god while troubles last and our eternal home end of poem this recording is in the public domain A mighty fortress is our God. Ein Festburg ist unser Gott. By Martin Luther. Translated from the German by Frederick Henry Hedge. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4. The Higher Life, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org. By Jason in Canada. A mighty fortress is our God. A mighty fortress is our God a bulwark never failing our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing for still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe his craft and power are great and armed with equal hate on earth is not his equal did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing were not the right man on our side the man of god's own choosing doth ask who that may be christ jesus it is he lord sabbath his name from age to age the same and he must win the battle end of poem this recording is in the public domain delight in god by francis quarles from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part one read for librivox dot org by jason in canada delight in god 
I love, and have some cause to love, the earth. She is my maker's creature, therefore good. She is my mother, for she gave me birth. She is my tender nurse, she gives me food. But what's a creature, Lord, compared with thee? Or what's my mother, or my nurse, to me? I love the air, her dainty sweets refresh my drooping soul and to new sweets invite me. Her shrill mouth choir sustain me with their flesh, and with their polyphonian notes delight me. But what's the air, or all the sweets that she can bless my soul withal, compared to thee? I love the sea. She is my fellow creature, my careful purveyor. She provides me store. She walls me round. She makes my diet greater. She wafts my treasure from a foreign shore. But, Lord of oceans, when compared with thee, what is the ocean or her wealth to me? To heaven's high city I direct my journey, whose spangled suburbs entertain mine eye. Mine eye, by contemplation's great attorney, transcends the crystal pavement of the sky. But what is heaven, great God, compared to thee? Without thy presence, heaven's no heaven to me. Without thy presence, earth gives no refection. Without thy presence, sea affords no treasure. Without thy presence, air is a rank infection. Without thy presence, heaven's itself no pleasure. If not possessed, if not enjoyed in thee, what's earth or sea or air or heaven to me? the highest honors that the world can boast are subjects far too low for my desire the brightest beams of glory are at most but dying sparkles of thy living fire the loudest flames that earth can kindle be but nightly glow-worms if compared to thee without thy presence wealth is bags of cares wisdom but folly joy disquiet sadness Friendship is treason, and delights are snares. Pleasures but pain, and mirth but pleasing madness. Without thee, Lord, things be not what they be, nor have their being when compared with thee. In having all things, and not thee, what have I? Not having thee, what have my labors got? Let me enjoy but thee, what further crave I? and having thee alone what have i not i wish nor sea nor land nor would i be possessed of heaven heaven unpossessed of thee francis quarles end of poem this recording is in the public domain the will of god by Frederick William Faber From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao The Will of God I worship thee, sweet will of God, and all thy ways adore, And every day I live I seem to love thee more and more. Thou wert the end, the blessed roar of our Saviour's toils and tears, Thou wert the passion of his heart those three and thirty years. And he hath breathed into my soul a special love of thee, A love to lose my will in his, and by that loss be free. I love to see thee bring to naught the plans of wily men, When simple hearts outwit the wise, oh, thou art loveliest then. The headstrong world presses hard upon the church full oft, and then how easily thou turnst the hard ways into soft. I love to kiss each print where thou hast set thine unseen feet. I cannot fear thee, blessed will, thine empire is so sweet. When obstacles and trials seem like prison walls to be, I do the little I can do, and leave the rest to thee. I know not what it is to doubt, my heart is ever gay. I run no risk, for, come what will, thou always hast thy way. 
I have no cares, O blessed will, for all my cares are thine. I live in triumph, Lord, for thou hast made thy triumphs mine. And when it seems no chance or change from grief can set me free, hope finds its strength in helplessness, and gaily waits on thee. Man's weakness, waiting upon God, its end can never miss, for men on earth no work can do more angel-like than this. Ride on, ride on triumphantly, thou glorious will ride on. Faith's pilgrim sons behind thee take the road that thou hast gone. He always wins who sides with God, to him no chance is lost. God's will is sweetest to him when it triumphs at his cost. Ill that he blesses is our good, and unblessed good is ill. And all is right that seems most wrong, if it be his sweet will. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Voyage by Caroline Atherton Mason From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Voyage Whichever way the wind doth blow, Some heart is glad to have it so. Then blow it east or blow it west, The wind that blows, that wind is best. My little craft sails not alone, a thousand fleets from every zone are out upon a thousand seas and what for me were favouring breeze might dash another with the shock of doom upon some hidden rock and so i do not dare to pray for winds to waft me on my way but leave it to a higher will to stay or speed me trusting still that all is well and sure that he who launched my bark will sail with me through storm and calm and will not fail whatever breezes may prevail to land me every peril past within his sheltering heaven at last then whatsoever wind doth blow my heart is glad to have it so and blow it east or blow it west the wind that blows that wind is best End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Love of God by Eliza Scudder From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada The Love of God thou grace divine encircling all a soundless shoreless sea wherein at last our souls must fall o love of god most free when over dizzy heights we go one soft hand blinds our eyes the other leads us safe and slow o love of god most wise and though we turn us from thy face and wander wide and long thou holdst us still in thine embrace o love of god most strong the saddened heart the restless soul the toil-worn frame and mind alike confess thy sweet control o love of god most kind but not alone thy care we claim our wayward steps to win we know thee by a dearer name O love of God within! And filled and quickened by thy breath, Our souls are strong and free To rise o'er sin and fear and death. O love of God, to thee! Eliza Scudder End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Praise to God by Anna Laetitia Barbauld From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Praise to God Praise to God, immortal praise For the love that crowns our days 
bounteous source of every joy let thy praise our tongues employ for the blessings of the field for the stores the gardens yield for the vine's exalted juice for the generous olive's use flocks that white in all the plain yellow sheaves of ripened grain clouds that drop their fattening dews suns that temperate warmth diffuse all that spring with bounteous hand scatters o'er the smiling land all that liberal autumn pours from her rich or flowing stores these to thee my god we owe source whence all our blessings flow and for these my soul shall raise grateful vows and solemn praise yet should rising whirlwinds tear from its stem the ripening ear should the fig tree's blasted shoot drop a green untimely fruit should the vine put forth no more nor the olive yield her store though the sickening flock should fall and the herds desert the store should thine altered hand restrain the early and the latter rain blast each opening bud of joy and the rising year destroy yet to thee my soul should raise grateful vows and solemn praise and when every blessing's flown love thee for thyself alone end of poem this recording is in the public domain lead kindly light by john henry newman from the world's best poetry volume four the high life part one read for librivox.org by craig franklin lead kindly light lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom lead thou me on the night is dark and i am far from home lead thou me on keep thou my feet i do not ask to see the distant scene one step enough for me i was not ever thus nor prayed that thou shouldst lead me on i loved to choose and see my path but now lead thou me on i loved the garish days and spite of fears pride ruled my will remember not past years so long thy power hath blessed me sure it still will lead me on or moor and fen or crag and torrent till the night is gone and with the morn those angel faces smile which i have loved long since and lost a while end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Eternal Goodness by John Greenleaf Whittier From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin The Eternal Goodness O oh, friends, with whom my feet have trod the quiet aisles of prayer, glad witness to your zeal for God, and love of man i bear i trace your lines of argument your logic linked and strong i weigh as one who dreads dissent and fears a doubt as wrong 
but still my human hands are weak to hold your iron creeds against the words ye bid me speak my heart within me pleads who fathoms the eternal thought who talks of scheme and plan the lord is god he needeth not the poor device of man i walk with bare hushed feet the ground ye tread with boldness shod i dare not fix with meat and bound the love and power of god ye praise his justice even such his pitying love i deem ye seek a king i fain would touch the robe that hath no seam ye see the curse which overbroods a world of pain and loss i hear our lord's beatitudes and prayer upon the cross more than your schoolmen teach within myself alas i know too dark ye cannot paint the sin too small the merit show i bow my forehead to the dust i veil mine eyes for shame and urge in trembling self-distrust a prayer without a claim i see the wrong that round me lies i feel the guilt within i hear with groan and travail cries the world confess its sin yet in the maddening maze of things and tossed by storm and flood to one fixed trust my spirit clings i know that god is good not mine to look where cherubim and seraphs may not see but nothing can be good in him which evil is in me the wrong that pains my soul below i dare not throne above i know not of his hate i know his goodness and his love i dimly guess from blessings known of greater out of sight and with the chastened psalmist own his judgments too are right i long for household voices gone for vanished smiles i long but god hath led my dear ones on and he can do no wrong i know not what the future hath of marvel or surprise assured alone that life and death his mercy underlies and if my heart and flesh are weak to bear an untried pain the bruised reed he will not break but strengthen and sustain no offering of my own i have nor works my faith to prove i can but give the gifts he gave and plead his love for love and so beside the silent sea i wait the muffled oar no harm from him can come to me on ocean or on shore i know not where his islands lift their fronded palms in air i only know i cannot drift beyond his love and care o oh, brothers if my faith is vain if hopes like these betray pray for me that my feet may gain the sure and safer way and thou o lord by whom are seen thy creatures as they be forgive me if too close i lean my human heart on thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain strong son of god immortal love from in memoriam introduction by alfred lord tennyson from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part one read for librivox dot org by lian yao strong son of god immortal love strong son of god immortal love whom we that have not seen thy face by faith and faith alone embrace believing where we cannot prove thine are these orbs of light and shade thou madest life in man and brute thou madest death and lo thy foot is on the skull which thou hast made thou wilt not leave us in the dust 
the meanest man he knows not why he thinks he was not made to die and thou hast made him thou art just thou seemest human and divine the highest tallest man art thou our wills are ours we know not how our wills are ours to make them thine our little systems have their day End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. O Little Town of Bethlehem by Phillips Brooks From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao O Little Town of Bethlehem Little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by, yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together proclaim the holy birth, and praises sing to God the 
king and peace to men on earth how silently how silently the wondrous gift is gift so god imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven no it may hear his coming but in this world of sin where meek souls will receive him still the dear christ enters in o holy child of bethlehem descend to us we pray cast out our sin and enter in be born in us to-day we hear the christmas angels the great glad tidings tell oh come to us abide with us our lord emmanuel and a poem this recording is in the public domain the angel song by edmund hamilton sears from the world's best poetry volume four the Higher Life, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. The Angel Song. It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old, from angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. Peace to the earth, good will to men, from heaven's all gracious King. The world in solemn stillness lay, to hear the angels sing still through the cloven skies they come with peaceful wings unfurled and still the heavenly music floats o'er all the weary world above its sad and lowly plains they bend on heavenly wing and ever o'er its babel sounds the blessed angels sing yet with the woes of sin and strife the world has suffered long beneath the angel strain have rolled two thousand years of wrong and man at war with man hears not the love song which they bring o oh, hush the noise ye men of strife and hear the angel sing and ye beneath life's crushing load whose forms are bending low who toil along the climbing way with painful steps and slow look now for glad and golden hours come swiftly on the wing o oh, rest beside the weary road and hear the angel sing for lo the days are hastening on by prophet bards foretold when with the ever circling years comes round the age of gold when peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendours fling and the whole world send back the song which now the angels sing end of poem this recording is in the public domain epiphany by reginald heber from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part one read for librivox dot org by craig franklin epiphany we have seen his star in the east matthew two two brightest and best of the sons of the morning dawn on our darkness and lend us thine aid star of the east the horizon adorning guide where our infant redeemer is laid cold on his cradle the dewdrops are shining low lies his head with the beasts of the stall angels adore him in slumber reclining maker and monarch and saviour of all say shall we yield him in costly devotion odours of edom and offerings divine gems of the mountain and pearls of the ocean myrrh from the forest or gold from the mine vainly we offer each ample oblation vainly with gifts would his favour secure richer by far is the heart's adoration dearer to god are the prayers of the poor brightest and best of the sons of the morning dawn on our darkness and lend us thine aid 
star of the east the horizon adorning guide where our infant redeemer is laid end of poem this recording is in the public domain